all, I have basically two things I could talk about. I could talk about, you know, big picture web stuff, and I could talk about Ember. Um, but I have an hour, so I figure I could talk about both of those things. Um, and in particular, what I want to do is I want to give you sort of my thinking about the big picture. And obviously, since Ember is my, what I do as a practitioner, Ember is, is what I build, um, you can sort of get a sense for how I think about uh, the web and programming from some of how I'm going to be talking about Ember. Uh, and Ember in particular is, is a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, people have been building web frameworks for years, for, you know, for a decade or two decades. Um, so I sort of want to talk today about Ember in the context of today's web framework. So that's things like Angular and React, uh, Backbone, Aurelia, uh, all the frameworks you'll be hearing about later today. But before I can talk about what Ember and what these frameworks are doing today, I want to rewind a little bit. Uh, actually, not that far, but it seems like a long time uh, now. Actually, one of the things that I, I noticed when I started thinking about 2011, which is the same time that I started working on what would become Ember, um, is that if you think back to 2011, it's just four years ago, uh, but the concept of a transpiler was, was really, um, was really un unusual. People didn't think about it. So if you watch people give talks about uh, ES5, so ES5 had come out in 2009, and 2011 was when uh, the second version of ES5 came out, and people were giving talks about it. And even in 2011, which is pretty recent, when people would talk about the new syntax, you would get the idea from them that, well, you can never get new syntax into browsers, because we're going to have to support IE6 forever, so how are you going to get new syntax? Uh, libraries, those are easier. You could, you could polyfill a library, you could polyfill for each, but how do you get syntax into the browser? People, people didn't have a clear sense of how you would do that. And in today, in 2015, the answer is obvious. The answer is transpilers. Um, and transpilers have really done a lot to change the shape of what it means to add new syntax, add new features to the browser, but they're actually a really, really new phenomenon. So if you go back to 2011, uh, sort of the dominant uh, frameworks at the time were things like Sprout Core, Cappuccino, EXEJS, uh, Sencha had just come out. And all these frameworks were trying to do one thing, which was they were trying to say, we need to abstract the web. They took the idea that the web is fundamentally broken as an abstraction, the DOM is broken. You've heard these things over and over again. And so what we need to do to build a good web framework is we need to abstract away the web. And I was working on Rails at the time, so I, I sort of did some jQuery work, but I was, had spent the last couple of years before this working on Rails, and I really had come to like the web technology. I'd really come to like HTML, and I'd really come to like CSS, as crazy as that might sound. Um, in large part, just because those, those, are the, 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 those are the things that are the lingua franca of the web. Those are the things that anybody you're gonna work with knows how to work with. And, th and they're things that really evolved to be a really good fit for what the web was actually doing. So I sort of uh, finished working on Rails 3, took a look at the, the front end uh, story, and I said, I don't really like the fact that all these frameworks are trying to abstract away the web. I really want a solution that more embraces the things that are good about the web. And so the very first thing that I did when I uh, finished working on Rails is I built the templating engine called Handlebars. How many people have used Handlebars? Yeah, a lot of people, awesome, that's great. So um, originally, uh, I wasn't very ambitious about Handlebars. My main goal was just to build a templating engine that would be fast, um, and a templating engine that was not like mustache, very, very constrained, but not like a lot of the other templating engines that existed at the time, basically wild west. You could just type whatever JavaScript you wanted in there. Um, because I had in my mind the idea that what I wanted to do was to support some kind of data binding system. And I didn't know what I was gonna do yet, but I wanted to support it, so I sort of built a templating engine with that in mind. And sort of my philosophy at the time was that HTML and CSS are okay. That doesn't mean that HTML and CSS are the best technologies that anybody has ever built. Uh, it doesn't mean that you should you go around professing your love for HTML and CSS, but it means that HTML and CSS are what we have. And over and over again, you hear, you know, what we really need to do is we need to take the web and we need to start over and build just the good parts of the web without the bad parts. And I want to say, I don't think that's the right approach. And the reason I don't think that's the right approach is that I think evolution, both the human kind and the, you know, the technical kind that we build, I think is a much better solution for, for advancing uh, the things that we want to advance. And typically when you start talking about this, when you start saying, well, I think we can evolve our way 
uh, from where we are today into a better place, you hear a bunch of objections. Uh, probably the most common objection is you hear people say things like, um, well, HTML was designed as a document transport, and HTTP was designed as a way of sending documents. And it wasn't originally designed for applications. So because it wasn't originally designed for applications, we need to start over and build something that was originally designed for those things. And I don't, I don't agree with that. The reason I don't agree with that is I think uh, if you look at, this is, the, this is our, our ancestor, our first ancestor. It's a, a single-celled organism. And certainly this single-celled organism was not designed for programming. But I don't think anybody would suggest that we should go back and start and build a new human from scratch because the original design was not optimized for, for the thing that we're doing with it. Sometimes you have to take the good with the bad, right? Sometimes evolution gets us a lot of things that we like, a lot of things that are good. And together with evolution, we get the appendix and we get consoles and a bunch of other things that maybe we don't need. But it's really expensive to go back and start over. Um, so I want to start by, by talking about the good. Uh, wh what's good about the web? So first of all, the web is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And it's not a small project to build another thing that's everywhere. So everywhere doesn't just mean it's on my computer. It means it's on uh, mobile devices. It's on embedded devices. It's, on my, it's, on, it's in my Wii. It's in my PlayStation. It's everywhere, literally everywhere. Um, it's viral. It's really easy to take whatever you're looking at. If you're looking at a piece of content, it's really easy to take it and share it. And that doesn't just mean share it on AOL in 1999 or Facebook today. It means any place where you could put a piece of text, I can take the thing that I'm looking at and give it to you. And that's something that has been true from the beginning, from Tim Berners-Lee's original idea for the web. It's been true from then until now, and I would imagine that it will be true for a very long time. And that's really a powerful thing. It means that you, it's really hard for someone to take control and say, you have to do all your sharing through me because it's so easy to take a piece of content and share it with anybody that lets you paste in text, which is basically everybody. Um, it's also not a system that's owned, right? So many, many platforms that people try to replace uh, the web with are owned in some way or another. You have to get permission to publish. And that doesn't always mean you have to knock on somebody's door or pay somebody to publish, although sometimes it means that. Sometimes it just means that there's a censorship system in place. It, it may be a really benign censorship system, like it has to be family friendly or something like that, right? But in many, many platforms, you don't have the freedom to just publish uh, largely whatever you want. The, the system is owned by somebody. Uh, it's also uh, cross-platform. And when I say cross-platform, I don't mean like the way Flex was cross-platform, where you could take uh, one thing and run it anywhere. I mean a very specific thing, which is that um, the web is cross-platform, but it has access to the native look and feel. So when you use a select box on the web, you actually get a thing that looks correct on iOS 6 and iOS 7. It looks correct on Android Gingerbread, and it looks correct on Android uh, Lollipop. It looks correct on my desktop. It looks correct on Windows. It looks correct on Windows 10, right? And that's something that is very, very difficult to build. You can look, you can look at Flex, for example, with Flex's select boxes. Flex's select box wasn't a bad select box. It was a pleasant enough select box. But the fact that it feels so different from the underlying platform makes you not want to use it. And it makes, it makes it difficult to say, you know, you know forget, about the, forget about HTML. I'm going to draw my own select box with Canvas. The problem is that now you're drawing something that looks the same on all platforms, despite the fact that every platform has their own look and feel. Even things that are simple, like how scrolling works. If you're on an Android device, you probably experience this. If you're on an Android device and you go to a website that's emulating iOS scrolling, it feels really bad, right? And that's a really simple thing, like how do you emulate scrolling on a Canvas? So there's all these details. Um, and, and cross-platform is correct. And this last one I, I know is going to be controversial, but the web is the only platform that exists where people regularly run untrusted, unaudited, unknown code on any device that they happen to have. And you might say that that's a bad idea, but the reality is that any other platform in the world doesn't even come close to beginning to allow you to do this. And the web, for all of its uh, positives, and bene uh, positives and negatives on the security front, at least supports this, this use case. And it's a really important one that you, you can click on a link and not have to fear that someone's going to hack your computer. OK, so what about the bad? Well, you can't, you can't vertically center a div. That sucks. You can't, you can't display video. You can't, we can't compete with native performance. Wait, none of this is, this is true. This is, this is the stuff we said we were never going to be able to fix in 2007. right? This is all the stuff that we said that you know the last time someone was cynical and pessimistic about the web, that's what they told you. Right? But in reality, all these things, all the things on the previous slide, we've dealt with, and we've dealt with them in a very evolutionary way. Admittedly, we did this in a largely additive way.
But that, just because we added something doesn't mean that what's left over is not good. Um, and in fact, one of the best ways of dealing with uh, systems that are additive only, and there's plenty of these, like x86 is an additive only system, uh, Unix is an additive only system, C is an additive only system. There's a lot of things that we build on that are, that are really hard to take things away from. Um, one of the really great things about, um, one, of the, one of the best ways of dealing with additive only systems is to create the good parts, to say, if you're building, if you're writing JavaScript, or if you're writing for the web today, you shouldn't use all the system, you should use part of the system. And in fact, the web has embraced this idea of the good parts with things like CSP, the, the content security policy, where you as a, as a user could say, I do not want uh, eval, for example. I do not want third party scripts. You can say all these things, and maybe we don't have a big enough, we don't have a small enough subset yet for security, but we do have a mechanism of, of letting people opt into a smaller subset of, of saner uh, JavaScript and, a, and saner web. So it's not really the case that we're, we're stuck. So what I would say is that really the bad, the, the, whatever list of bad you're going to write out in 2015, doesn't really matter because evolution is a really powerful force. And if you look at the last 10 years, if you look at how people felt 10 years ago, they felt like, you know, IE6 is going to be around forever. We can't add more features to the platform um, because how do you get all the browsers to adopt them? Or we can never remove features except, you know, Chrome removes features somehow. Uh, you look at the last 10 years and somehow all the things that people always say are intractable about the web end up being perfectly tractable. And so what I would say is, um, it's okay to be a web developer. It's okay to write code for the web that we have. It's okay to push for improving the web. And evolution is a very powerful force. It got us from the single-celled organism to a human programmer in admittedly many millions of years. But um, evolution is very powerful, especially when we're shaping it. And it's something that we, I think we've done a really good job at. If you look at the past 10 years, we've done amazing things and I think we'll continue to do, do so. So that's sort of my, my feeling about the web. Um, with, that, with that out of the way, I sort of want to talk about applications. So I want to talk about what it means to write a web application today. And a, a web application is actually a little bit of a different thing from sort of a, a native application. So native, application, native applications uh, don't have any uh, native way of sharing. So if I take, if I have an application, I want to, I'm looking at the New York Times on my phone. Um, and I want to share it with you. The, usually the way people do is they give you a URL to a website because it's really hard to share native applications. And uh, sort of the navigation model is usually very custom. It doesn't, it doesn't there's no links. There's no uh, going from page to page and things like that. And so the, the web model, whether it's uh, a web application that was served on the server that you're navigating around with links or whether it's one that's built on the client, um, I think is more than just a few widgets, more than just a couple of widgets. So, uh, I'm going to take a look at the Heroku dashboard, which is uh, an Ember app, to give you a sense of sort of how I think about it, what I, what I think is an application. So what you can see here is that there's three, uh, three big chunks of this application. Uh, there's the, out, the big outer area, which allows me to select between my, the Tilda app and my personal apps. Um, then inside of that, there's a, once I've clicked on Tilda, my, my own apps, I get another thing, which lets me look at apps, access, resources, settings. And then inside of there, once I've clicked on apps, I get a list of my applications, right? So you can sort of think about how this is working, uh, how an app works as being sort of an, a set of nested pages, right? So it's not, uh, it's not one big page that's the application. You have the application page and then nested inside of that is an organization and nested inside of that is the apps. Um, you might even think about this, although you should not implement it this way, as a series of nested iframes, right? So every, every piece inside of that is another iframe that you might be navigating around. And uh, sort of the interesting thing about the way these applications tend to work is if I go and I click on, uh, if I go and click on something else like settings over here, what ends up happening is that some of the, of the application stays the same, so the outer shell stays the same, um, and the, the bar on top stays the same, but just the bottom part uh, changes, the bottom part navigates away. And again, you could sort of imagine that there's iframes here. You've, you've clicked on settings and what happened is you navigated the inner iframe to a new page. So now we have a different set of things. We have the application, we saw the organization, but now we have settings instead. So let me go back here. And then, uh, you know, if I click on a completely different, uh, completely different thing, um, you'll see that the application on the out, outer side is still the same. It still looks the same way as it looks before. But now that I've clicked on an individual app, you know, I, I clicked up from the list on an individual app, 
we've changed a few things. We've changed the outer app and we've changed the inner resources. So um, the reason I'm showing you this is not necessarily to, to get you to be really familiar with the Heroku application, but to show you that an app has multiple pages, right? So a lot of people, um, when they're looking at web frameworks, when they're looking at things like Ember and, and uh, Angular and React and Aurelia, uh, a lot of people are not building what I would consider necessarily an app. I would say that they might be building a single page. Uh, I don't mean single page app. I, I mean, they might be building a widget, right? So they, or they might be building a really rich thing, like the New York Times, for example, uh, takes, uh, builds interactive graphics. They're, they have a, a whole team, and the whole team's job is just to build interactive graphics. But every one of those interactive graphics, they may, may be really complicated and rich. They're not an application. There's no navigation, there's no URLs. There's just a, a interactivity. And that interactivity is great. Uh, but it's not really an application. So uh, the first criteria for an application is that an application has multiple pages that you're navigating around. Um, interestingly, I think while it's, it is the case that a lot of things are not applications, a lot of things that you might not think of as applications uh, become applications quickly. A lot of things that you might not think of as having multiple pages end up with multiple pages very quickly. Um, also interestingly, pretty much in all applications that I've ever seen, Though these pages are somewhat nested. So uh, you usually end up having a layout that represents sort of your entire application. And then inside of that, you might have, you know, the top level navigation. And inside of that, you might have another level of navigation. And you, in the Heroku case, there's even navigation inside the next level. So there's all manner of navigation. And I think, and the user is navigating between these things. And I think this is, uh, it's really interesting because the way traditionally people would make these kinds of applications is they would, render all our content on the server. And the really awesome thing about rendering all the content on the server is that every time you click on a link and go to a new page, everything, all your state is blown away. So you could just basically do whatever you want. You could write whatever jQuery code you want. And as soon as you navigate to a new page, all your state is blown away and you get a whole new fresh state. And uh, I say awesome because it means that you could do a lot of, um, you could do a lot of unscalable stuff. You could do a lot of sort of spaghetti code and it, what you did on one page might not affect another page. And that's actually really great. That means that you could build up a really big complicated application and it doesn't necessarily, it's, it's uh, you, you may be able to avoid it becoming too complicated. Um, and I think this is sort of a core principle of applications is that you wanna make sure that once you realize you have maybe 50 pages in your application, or in my, uh, Skylight is a simple application and it has maybe like 15 pages. Um, it's really important that each of these pages is conceptually separate from each other. And uh, I, I like to say that the, once you realize that you have pages, you realize that there's a simple matter of bootstrapping, which is not so simple at all. Um, figure out how to get the data that you need into each page. So it's really easy, you know, when you're taste testing a new framework, any framework in the world, it's really easy if you have one page to get the data into the one page, right? It's when the page loads, you go download the data, you instantiate your root component, you throw the root component into the page, put the data in there and you're done. Right? And then if, if every single time you go to a new page, you blow away all the state and start over, like in the server model, it's no problem. You just do exactly the same thing. You, you, you effectively use page loading as your signal to go get data and install the uh, component. But when you start, when you stop wanting to pay the cost of going back to the server and downloading a whole bunch of new HTML and new JavaScript and executing it again, when you start wanting to use uh, a framework to navigate, which is what Ember uh, tries to encourage, uh, you actually, you need a different signal. The signal of the page load, load only happens one time. And so what you now need is some kind of mechanism, some kind of framework for dealing with, okay, I have now entered page X. Okay, now I've moved to page Y. So please tear down all the things from page X and do this stuff from page Y. And you would ideally like that to be as, as pleasant and as isolated and as um, sort of carefree as the code that you would have written on the server side. So what is, what is Ember? What is the goal of Ember? Um, from, the, from a high level, what Ember tries to do is Ember tries to give you a model of modeling these pages in a way that's isolated from each other. So we, of course, have a component model, and I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit. But the thing that we do that I think we've spent the most time on by far is how you model the pages and the navigation and the user flows between these pages. Because it's really easy, again, if you're not thinking about multiple pages, to get yourself into a pickle where you're trying to stuff all the, everything that you ever have to do into the loaded signal. Or maybe you put all the logic into the code that actually you clicked on a link, and maybe you put the logic for tearing down and setting up in that link. But what if you go to that same page? What if you go to page B from another location? All of a sudden, all that teardown code that you wrote stops working, and all of a sudden you start leaking memory. So, 
What Ember tries to do here is Ember tries to give you a model for thinking about the individual pages that you have um, in a way that's, that's fairly isolated from each other. So uh, we sort of give you a way to think about it. And I like to say that the, the trick to big applications, to applications written at scale, is isolation. And what I mean by isolation is that if I have an application like this, and I go and I make a mess in apps. I do, I do some, you know, some messy code. I have a bad day, or I hired an intern, or you know, any number of things bad can happen. A junior developer happens to be assigned to work on that page. And someone goes and makes a mess here. What I really would like is for that mess to not affect some other page, or you know, the, the, the nav bar on top, or this other page in application. So uh, what I like to say is that good isolation lets you write the kind of code that doesn't scale. So uh, people know how to, how to write jQuery, and people know how to write C, you know, CSS code, and the problem with writing jQuery and writing CSS is not that manipulating the DOM is necessarily fundamentally a broken paradigm. Some people like to say that, and, and in Ember you tend to write a lot less jQuery than you, you would have written, but sometimes you need jQuery, sometimes you need D3, right? Um, what good isolation lets you do is it lets you say, you know, I'm, I can't figure out how to do this in the right, in the correct way. I don't have, my, my brain is not on today. I just want to get, bang out some code right now. And you can bang out that code with good isolation in a way that doesn't break the rest of the application. And I think personally, as a, as a person who has good days and bad days, um, I find it rather exhausting to be writing code in paradigms that say you have to be perfect all the time. If you mess up anywhere, uh, a good example of this would be uh, BEM in CSS. So BEM is like, a way of writing CSS such that nothing can ever, nothing from here can ever break anything from there. But it means that you have to always do everything perfectly. You have to always do the job exactly right. And you can't use the techniques that you might have used when you were starting out as a, a web developer. And I think that, that sort of thing um, is just asking for you to fail, ultimately. It's asking for you to get to a point with your application where enough people had enough bad days or enough people uh, wrote code that didn't, well, that wasn't the right thing that leaked into other areas and suddenly um, your entire application doesn't really make sense anymore. So what we like to do is we like to say that what you want to do is now that you've taken all these screens from the server and moved them to the client, what you want to do is you want to treat every single screen like its own separate app. Again, like sort of like an iframe. Um, and I, I want to be clear, I'm sort of talking about this from the, from the point of view of Ember. Uh, many other frameworks have some tool uh, in the works, some, something that was inspired by Ember's router that allows you to, to use these same ideas in another framework. The thing that Ember has going for it on this stuff is that it's baked in, it's part of the, the main way that everyone does stuff. So if you go to Stack Overflow and say, I wanna know how to do some problem, everybody can assume that you're building an application with these ideas, which is, is really helpful. Um, so again, so you wanna treat every screen like its own app, uh, like its own uh, iframe, and what I mean by that, what, what ends up happening is that Ember gives you a way to do uh, structured bootstrapping. So in the same way that when you use jQuery, you can say, when the page loads, I want to do this stuff. And that, that feels very structured when you have a single page, right? It gives you a way of describing how to do stuff at, a, uh, at the right point in time. But it starts really falling apart when you have a lot of pages. Um, Ember gives you sort of that same idea, the same uh, setup and teardown hooks um, for, the, for these smaller pages. And so the way that that ends up working is that there are lifecycle hooks in the router. So uh, every single page gets its own object called a route. And that route allows you to do, to, to manage the lifecycle. What happens when you enter for the first time? What happens when you exit, et cetera? Um, and one of the really nice things that came out of this, like really, really early on, is if you go to Heroku, the Heroku dashboard, um, and you just load the page, you'll see that there's a loading spinner. And pretty much everybody ever uh, needs a loading spinner. Um, a, a funny example of this is, uh, there's a, a private beta uh, of an Ember app that I've been using recently called Canvas. Um, it's really cool. It's by the Heroku guys, actually, who, who started their own company, and they're using Ember again, which is great. Uh, I'm happy with that. And I was using it, and I noticed that there were, they had an error, which was a bug. But when that error happened, I just got a white screen. And I pinged them, and I said, hey, why don't you have an error page? Why don't you have a loading page? And I didn't have to tell them, you know, why don't you figure out how to listen for the promise and when the promise gets rejected, why don't you go and update the DOM and blah, blah, blah. I was able to tell them, why don't you, you know, please put error.hbs in your directory and now you'll have an error page. And maybe that's not the perfect solution for every single application when your application gets big and successful, but just being able to say, I, you know, at the beginning of a project when you're still in you know, banging out, bang it out mode, I want to have a loading page, I want to have an error page. This comes out of the idea of having the fact that you're actually building pages that have state 
um, that have a, a point where you're loading things asynchronously and when you're done loading asynchronously, um, this ends up being really powerful. And fundamentally what this means in, in Ember, again, is that we assume that you're building an application. And it's very easy, uh, it's very easy to forget this because I think uh, a lot of people compare Ember to other, uh, to other frameworks. And it's, if you compare Ember to, build, to, to another framework for the purpose of building a, a widget or a small component, I think you're gonna be pretty disappointed in Ember. But if you compare Ember to other frameworks for the purpose of building an application, I think you'll find that we get a lot of mileage out of this shared assumption that we're building an application with navigation and pages. So let me give you sort of a, a sense of what it means, what it looks like to load some content into a page. So again, this is gonna look pretty similar to what you might do with jQuery. So first of all, when you load a page for the first time, there's a loading, uh, you're, you go into the, what, the loading state internally. And what the loading state does is it goes and it puts a loading screen on the page, like I, so, I showed before. If you make a file called loading.hbs, handlebars, we'll put that on the screen. And that's, that's good. And the next thing that we do is we, there's a hook that we call into that says, hey, give me the model for this page. So every single page gets to have a main model that is powering it. And if that model is an error, so you know, if you make an XHR and the uh, XHR return to 404 or something like that, and it's an error, then Ember will put the error screen on the page. So you make an error.hbs, and like I said, now the error, error screen's on the page. And frankly, any error screen is better than a white screen, right? Anything, it could say, something has gone wrong, please report an error, and that's better than just seeing nothing, a white screen. So, so that, this is already pretty nice. You just have a single hook where you say, please go get this JSON, and then we automatically transition into the loading screen, we transition into the error screen if some error happens. And then finally, when you're done, we say, okay, we now have loaded the models and we go and render a component. And rendering the, a component is basically going to, of course, uh, like in any other framework, any V framework, um, it's gonna go and render a bunch of children. So that's sort of the, the high level um, idea. But, and if you've ever, like, uh, if you haven't used Ember but you've only heard of it or if you've only started using it a little bit, you might think, well, that's a very prescript prescriptive way of doing things. That's a very opinionated way of doing things. What if what I want instead is to do something a little bit different? And uh, this is something that I think historically Rails hasn't been uh, that great at. Rails has gotten better over time. But this is something that as, as a person who joined Rails originally to make this story better, it's something that I cared about from the beginning of Ember. So for example, um, let's say you don't actually want a loading screen or an error screen. What if you want to do something more custom? Well, no problem. In the, the loading screen and the error screen are just the default implementations of the loading callback and the error callback. So you can implement a loading callback and an error callback. You could report back to the server. You could you know, do some direct DOM manipulation if that's what you want. You can do what, really whatever you want. And um, what about fetching models? So uh, the default way of fetching models in Ember, uh, if you're you know, building a totally new app and you control the client and the server, it, you would use Ember data and JSON API. And that, that, if you do that, that will be the easiest way. So if you ever use like Rails with Active Record, it's sort of the same story. If you are willing to follow all the rules that we tell you, you're gonna have a great experience. Um, but what if you, what if you can't? Uh, so for, for various reasons, uh, sometimes Ember data isn't, or, or JSON API isn't exactly the right uh, solution. So first of all, Ember data allows you to use other things. Um, there's even adapters for things like Firebase and Parse and CouchDB. Um, Mongo, but uh, if you can't even use Ember data at all because you're doing something really custom, Skylight actually has some examples of this, then the model hook is really, uh, is just super generic. You can just get whatever JSON you want in there. So um, again, there's some really great solutions if you want to be opinionated and get something out quickly and you control the whole stack, but if you need to fall back, there's always layers of the onion. This is something that we care a lot about. So we know that uh, we care a lot about making Ember really good and opinionated for cases where you just want to forget about everything and get the job done. But we also know that in, in the real world, for all kinds of reasons, the exact thing that we decided isn't exactly the right thing. And so there's always a layer of the onion directly below the top layer and usually another layer below that that you can dig into to still, to still uh, get something done without sort of punching a hole through the whole system. It's, it's not like you, you, know, you dig a layer down and now you're just like sort of on your own. It's usually a pretty um, structured hole. So what about, uh, what about components? So uh, components have sort of gone through a, a historical story. So Ember 1.0 was the first release of Ember that ever had a component in Ember. Before that we had a thing called Views which we inherited from Sprout Core. Um, so Ember 1.0, I uh, shipped a very small file called component.js and it 
made, it basically created a nice conventional story, a uh, subclass of views that did the right thing. And uh, over the year after that, we learned a lot from Angular, actually, and we uh, improved components to be uh, both more conventional and more powerful, and that was pretty great. And then sort of the year after that, so uh, Ember 1.0 1, 1 is about, is closing in on two years. Um, this sort of the second year has been an exploration of, of React. And so I think uh, I'll talk more about this soon, but the basic thing that, that React has taught us in the component part, and it's important to note here that the component part is just like a little piece of the whole uh, bootstrapping cycle in Ember. But in the component part of the system, what we sort of discovered is that unidirectional data flow, um, what we call in Ember data down and actions up instead of sort of bindings flying everywhere, that is a, a much easier way of thinking about things than the two-way binding story that everyone used to do before. Um, and so, uh, basically, Ember has adopted, just for our part, just for the V of MVC, right? So again, there's, uh, there's the V of MVC and then there's the rest uh, of, of the system. But just for the V of MVC, we've sort of adopted that. Again, I'll go into that a little more. Before I say that, I just want to say that I think it's really easy when you're getting started and you get this awesome component primitive. So when you're, you know, when you're starting to learn any web framework, one of the first things that you learn is how to use components. And it's really tempting to say, oh, well, I have a component, and now I can make a parent component, now I have a bunch of children, and I make a parent component, all that keeps working. So surely the correct solution for building applications is that I just keep going up to the top, and at some point I have my app component. But the problem with doing that is that all the stuff that I showed before about how, we, how you can manage life cycles, about how you want to isolate uh, pages from each other, how you want to have a good structure for what pages even are, all that goes away if you try to model the whole thing as just a giant tree of components. Um, because none of, some of those components are special. Some of those components are the top of a page. Um, and, and like I said before, the, the trick to scale, I think, the trick to building an application with dozens of pages, is to have the pages be really isolated from each other and to have a, a framework that helps you do that. So uh, again, th that's just sort of an aside just to say, I think components are awesome. I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about components, but I think it's important to, to not get too caught up into thinking that you just keep going and then you get to the app at the top, that there's more going on um, once you get to the page level. So components. Uh, you probably, you may have heard this before, components are like functions. I, pretty much every framework uses this analogy. And the reason people say that is because what components let you do is they let you break up a big thing. So you know, sometimes you write a big program, and what functions let you do is they let you take pieces of the program and break them up into little pieces, and those little pieces are easier to reason about. So you can look at the, the function, you can see what the inputs are, you can see what it does, uh, maybe, uh, maybe they have side effects, and usually if the function is sufficiently small, you can sort of understand what the side effects are. So by taking this a really big program and breaking it up into functions, you can understand more easily what each thing is doing. And that's sort of the, the idea behind components. The idea behind components is that you take something that's bigger or repeated, and you break it up into little pieces that you could, that you could reuse over and over again. So here's an example of a, of a Twitter bootstrap button, and they tell you what you need to type is, you know, button class equals, and then a bunch of repetition, type equals submit, and you put the button in there. Um, but what we really want to type is this. We want to type bootstrap button, button, close bootstrap button, and that's it. That's what we want to type. And Ember lets you, lets you type that, and the implementation of, of this is very simple. So this is, you would make a file called bs-button.hbs, and it would look like this. So all the repeated parts are the same, and yield just means whatever was, whatever was inside gets uh, replaced. So whatever was between the opening and closing part gets smashed into that yield area. So that's a really simple example, uh, very simple. But what if we have you know, more kinds? What if we have uh, Twitter Bootstrap lets you have primary buttons and info buttons? Um, but you can see that there's a lot of the same stuff here, right? So you don't want to have to make a new Bootstrap uh, a new component for every single one of these things because so much of it is the same. What we would like to be able to type is something like uh, BS button type equals primary, and then if we leave off the type, we want it to have a default, which was the, the same default that we had before. And again, the implementation in Ember is pretty sim simple. You would make a BS button.hbs, and we would extend it a little bit. So we would still have the button, and then we would say, okay, if we have a, a type attribute coming in, use it, otherwise use default and then we yield like we yielded before. So the, the basic idea of a component in Ember is that you take um, something that was either 
repeated or part of a, a bigger program that you want to make smaller. You decide what the inputs are. Um, in, the, in the first example, the input was just whatever the content was. In the second example, the input also included a type. And then you, you figure out how to, how to represent that. And then, the, then when you, you know, render the whole thing, you get, you get the right behavior. Now, one of the things I really like about the Ember system, so Ember uses templates, um, and if you're, if you're a big fan of React, you probably know that they tell you that templates are evil, and really what you want it to do is put everything in the same uh, file, and, and it's just JavaScript, and you can just use your maps and filters and whatever, and that's awesome. Um, and I, I'm not going to deny, I've, I've used React, and I've looked at a lot of React examples, and I'm not going to deny that there's a lot of benefits to that approach, but I want to talk about for a second, the benefits that I see to the Ember approach of actually using templates. So here is, here's a template, and one of the things that I, I like about this template is that you can look at it, and even if you don't really know handlebars that well, or even if you don't really spend the time to really look at what's happening here, you can get a, ba a basic sense of what the structure of this, of this template is doing, right? And if we zoom in a little bit, you can see that, you know, there's an, e there's an each in, we're looping over categories, um, then we make if uh, we make a product category row, and then we make uh, uh, we loop over the products that are inside of that, and then we put a product row in there, right? And you can sort of look at this and get a sense of the structure without having to run any code in your head, right? I, I think it's for me, it's really important that when you're looking at templates, um, sometimes it's it's your designer, but sometimes for me, it's m me with my designer hat on. I'm looking at it, and I don't really want to be like running code in my head. I just want to look at it and get a sense for what it is that the, the structure is doing. Uh, there's one thing worth noting here, so uh, the big benefit that, that you're told of doing it the other way is that you don't, is that you can sort of intersperse the code directly into, uh, into the markup and then you can, so, so you can uh, sort of compute values that you need on the fly. So in this case you can see that there's a little bit of a suspicious thing going on here which is that we're looping over categories but where are those categories coming from? Um, if you were writing this code in React you would be computing them on the fly. Um, so in Ember, the way that this works is that there's a hook called did receive adders, uh, and what did receive adders does is it gets called anytime the attributes change. So uh, however the attributes change, you get this hook gets called, and what we do here is we just basically compute the categories that we need, and we set them on our on our, ourselves. Uh, if you're familiar with React, that set there is basically analogous to set state. So we're setting the categories on ourselves, and then we have access to them in our template. And uh, I actually kind of think that it's nice that th this data crunching part, the part that says, okay, what are the categories anyway, is in one place, and then the structure is in, in another place. Um, I think there's definitely uh, benefits to both approaches, but I think it's, it's too quick to throw out the benefits of being able to look at a template and getting the structure. Um, just for comparison, here's the imperative style, and th this is, there, again, there are benefits here. You don't need a separate function uh, to compute the categories. But for me, I look at this and it's not easy for me without running all this code in my head to figure out what the output looks like. If you, if you look at the uh, structure on the right side, what you'll see is that it embeds some rows, and in order to figure out what those rows are, you need to actually go and run the code on the left side and figure out what's going on. And again, there's benefits, there's cost and benefits, there, there are real uh, wins to having things be just JavaScript, quote unquote, but um, I think there's cost as well, and I think it, it's good, it would be good as an ecosystem for us to really think about these costs and benefits instead of taking it for granted that, they're, that uh, templates are sort of the old, the old way. Um, if I go back here, you'll see that I think this, this, I think empirically is easier to understand the structure of than this guy. Okay, so, so that said, I wanna talk about, people often talk about React and they say, well, what React is good at is React has virtual DOM, and I think both and basically everybody who's paying attention has said, including the React guys, like that's not really the thing, there's other important things. And so for me, there are really four things that are really good about what React does, things that React does in the V layer. Um, so number one, and these are all things that, I, that nobody did before, so but these are things that React genuinely uh, innovated on, came up with as, an, as a new idea that um, nobody else was doing before. Um, so first of all, in a, in a React uh, component hierarchy, there's always one component that conceptually owns the data. And what that means is that there's not, uh, it's not like there's a bunch of components that are all mutating some value and it sort of exists in the sky and it goes and updates everywhere. There's one component that owns the data. So you can always think about uh, where that, those changes are occurring. Um, there's also one way data flow by default. So of course, you have to mutate things sometimes, but the way that the data normally flows is by sending data down 
and then you, you call callbacks that were passed up. So in Ember, we call that data down actions up. Um, the third point is, is really an important one, which is uh, it's real, sometimes it's really nice to be able to just say, I don't really know exactly how this thing changed, but the input changed somehow, so I just want you to re-render the whole thing. Uh, that's actually quite often a nice thing to be able to do, and it's something that you were able to do on the server side it's something that basically all client-side frameworks were able to do, but they were very slow at it. So not just a little slow. If you were to try to do that in Ember, historically, it would have been pathologically slow. It would have been painfully, embarrassingly slow. Um, and React basically came up with a, a way of, of letting you say, whenever something changes, I want to refresh it, and I'm going to be smart at uh, updating all these things quickly. Um, and then finally, uh, React provides a bunch of lifecycle hooks, um, like the did receive adders hook that I showed in the previous slide. And those, the important thing about these hooks is that they run no matter how the underlying data changed. So whether the data changed because uh, your Flux store changed it, or whether the data changed because uh, you changed it manually in your component hierarchy, or whether the data changed because someone above you changed the attributes, these lifecycle hooks always fire. And that's actually really important because it lets you not think a lot about gr how granularly things are propagating and just think more about, well, something happened to this component and now I can go and, you know, do whatever, react, whatever reaction I need to do, which often is just running some JavaScript. So these were all awesome things. And um, when, when we looked at them as a core team a few years ago, uh, or last year, we were all really blown away by how elegant a lot of this was. So when we went to make uh, Glimmer components, we wanted to adopt a lot of these ideas. And so this is a duplicate of the previous slide. Glimmer components do all these things. Um, components own their own data. There's one-way data flow by default. Uh, we support uh, re-rendering in a way that, that's fast. Um, it's a, a little bit of a different strategy, but it ends up with the same result. And your lifecycle hooks happen no matter how things change. Um, now because we, so that's, that's a really great uh, set of things about the view layer, but because we assume that you're building a whole application, we're able to take, make those changes to the view layer, but leave the, you know, the surrounding area, all the, the nice things about how, how data gets loaded, how it gets into pages, how pages get isolated, how navigation works. We basically leave that stuff around your application and all that stuff continues to work. And what's kind of cool about this is if you have heard about um, if you've heard about components in other frameworks, components are often touted as a story of isolation, right? So if you make a component, it's isolated from other components, and that's great. And uh, what Ember tries to do is Ember tries to say, so there's, there's uh, components that are isolated from each other, but then there's also pages that are isolated from each other. So there's multiple layers of isolation. So even if you accidentally uh, somehow leak something in your component by doing something really crazy, you have to do something even crazier to cause it to break another page. So, uh, for example, if I go and I work on my settings page, if I do something to change an email, and I break something there, it's not going to change a totally different pages. There's, there's, there's many layers of protection against going out and doing really crazy stuff. And I think that's actually really great. So, sort of my last topic for today is, uh, this is sort of a controversial point, but I think it's obviously true if you think about it, that every, basically every web application that's of, at any scale, if it's not like a tiny thing that is a widget, like the New York Times widgets, um, you end up doing some amount of processing. So historically it was things like minification and concatenation, but now it's things like transpilation. Um, it's things like building manifests uh, so that you can do cache busting. Uh, it's things like uh, automatically squishing your images down so that they don't end up being unnecessarily large if they can be losslessly compressed. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you would like to do um, as part of the process of building an application. And so a really good application is, uh, is basically compiled, a compiled output. And one of the things that we did pretty early on with Ember is we created a tool called Ember CLI that basically takes, is the tool, it's sort of like Xcode or the Android uh, tools for basically taking your Ember application and converting it into something that you can use. And it also does development. So I, I made a little screencast here, it's a couple minutes. I hope it's watchable from this distance. Um, I'll sort of narrate as I go, but uh, showing how this works. So first of all, uh, we start off by, you always build a new application by saying Ember new. And the nice thing about this is that you get a scaffold that's basically built. You're going to see NPM and things run much faster than they, they should run. That's because I cut them out, or I thought I did, anyway. Yeah, so that probably took like minutes in reality. So we're installing some packages. We're creating a new application. Um, this is basically handling a lot of the stuff. It's giving you all the dependencies that you would normally need. 
Um, so we're installing packages here. We're installing Bower, right? So uh, we don't like Bower that much, but a lot of stuff is still there and, uh, until we can transition. So then after we've installed things, I'm gonna go into the directory, JS channel, and I'm gonna run Ember S. And Ember S is basically a server, if you use like Rails or Django or something like that, it's just a server that runs in the background. And you can see, as soon as I boot, I already have an application that says, welcome to Ember JS. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open another tab here and I'm gonna go into the application. And uh, I'm gonna go into the template, I'm gonna make a little tweak to it, I'm gonna add a, a div class equals container here, and I'm gonna change welcome to Ember JS to uh, welcome to JS channel. And uh, this automatically provides a live reload server in the background, so when I switch back, you can see it is already updated automatically for you. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna generate a new route, and that route is gonna be called index. And index is just sort of the main page that you go to when you go to a new Ember application. So I'm gonna go into uh, JS channel, I'm gonna generate the index route, and then I'm gonna go back here, I'm gonna open the index route, and I'm gonna change it to say, uh, hi, Amit. There's probably several Amits in the room, so you can guess which one I might be talking about. So I'm gonna say, hi, Amit, and I'm gonna save, and again, I'm gonna, if I open this, it has live reloaded for me, and it says, hi, Amit. So that's great, but what I really wanna do is get some data from the server. I don't have a server here, so I'm just gonna use uh, set timeout to, uh, to provide the data. So I'm gonna return a new promise, a new ember.rsvp.promise, uh, if you don't know about promises, it's pretty simple. One thing you'll notice here is that uh, I'm using ES6 syntax, and that's sort of built in. When you build a new Ember app, you get a transpilation for ES6 syntax automatically, and what I'm doing is I'm setting a timeout, and I'm resolving the promise that I created with a new uh, JSON object called with name of Amit. And this would be equivalent to if you would return a dollar that get JSON or something like that. And I'm gonna change this so instead of saying hi Amit, it now pulls the data off of the model. So this is what I was talking about before where, what you, where you can get, um, you get an automatic flow that says when I entered index, here is the model that I wanted to download. But what you'll notice is that now it took a second to show the data, but we don't want that. We wanna show a loading uh, page. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new page. You'll see I called it loading.hps. And just by calling it loading.hps, we now have a loading page uh, that shows up automatically without having to do anything else. Now, I don't really like the look of this. What I would like to do is I would like to load, uh, I would like to add Bootstrap, so I'm gonna go to emberaddons.com and look for Bootstrap. And you can see here that there's an add-on called Ember Bootstrap. But I'm gonna go to Ember Observer, which is a site that categorizes and scores a bunch of add-ons. And I'm gonna go look at that Ember Bootstrap just to make sure it looks good. So when I go to Bootstrap, I, there's a category, I go look at it, and I say, okay, it has a score of seven. I go into that and you can see that someone has done things like check to make sure it's accessible and whatever. Uh, score of seven seems fine. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ember install uh, ember dash bootstrap, hit enter. It's gonna add, it's gonna add it, it's gonna automatically cause it to get imported, make it available, the CSS available and everything like that. And now if I uh, restart the server and reload the page, what's gonna happen is now it's gonna be using bootstrap, which is great. Now what I wanna do just to show you that it's the real bootstrap, it's the real deal is just uh, add a couple of classes to these, the CSS, so uh, it's an alert of success. And loading, I'm gonna say it's an alert of info. And if I load it, what you'll see is that it says loading, it says info, okay. So that's all, that's all great. And really the point of that was not to necessarily give you a demo of how to build an Ember app, that wasn't really an Ember app, but actually there's a uh, last thing, which is that I'm gonna run uh, Ember build, and Ember build actually creates the thing that you could upload to S3 or something like that, and I can go into the disk directory, run a simple server, now it's on port 8000, and it's exactly the same. It's, uh, it's been built for production, it has minified, it has done all the things, and that's pretty great. So, so uh, you can see it's basically the exact same app as the one that was in the development server. So that's pretty awesome, and again, the idea here is not necessarily to show you how to build an Ember app that was a really boring Ember app, but more just to show you that there's a lot of things going on in the process of building a modern web application, and we really need, and having tools that sort of do it for you um, is really nice, and this is something that we spent a lot of time on. Again, because we're operating under the assumption that everyone building an Ember app is building an application, and not something where they're dropping it in, where we have to basically sort of serve the common denominator, every possible thing that anyone could be doing. Now, one of the things I'm really proud of, so we're now, we are now getting ready to ship Ember 2.0 like in the next couple of weeks, and one of the things I'm really proud of is our transition plan. Um, if you look at uh, the road to Ember 2.0 RFC, which is, uh, so we have an RFC process where we basically ask for community feedback on effectively any interesting thing that happens in Ember. And so we 
uh, announced this RFC in uh, December 2014, so that was quite some time ago now, and it got 253 comments, which is a lot of comments, and uh, a, a lot of really good feedback that changed the plan, actually, uh, because people, our initial plan was perhaps too aggressive. Um, and then over time, we published a lot of blog posts. My favorite of the, of, in the series is uh, this, the transition to Ember 2.0 in detail. This we published in May, and it basically goes through sort of now that we're really close, what is the exact set of things that you're going to have to do to transition your Ember application. So uh, this is all just to say we, we care a lot about semantic versioning. We care a lot about not breaking your applications. And even though we shipped a totally new rendering engine, the Glimmer rendering engine, which is really much faster than the old one, and it's totally new internals, we were really careful to make sure that existing apps would continue to work. We landed the Glimmer engine in 1.13, and it's compatible with existing applications using the public API. So that's, that was really exciting, and I think people were happy with that. Now, the JavaScript community loves silver bullets. I think. Uh, I don't know if this joke will go over well with this audience, but there's enough silver bullets in the JavaScript community to kill an army of vampires. Um, yeah, I could get like three laughs. Um, but we, the JavaScript community loves hunting for silver bullets. Pretty much any new framework that comes out is pitched as a silver bullet. It solves all your problems. It, it uh, eliminates all kinds of issues as you're going to make things ten times faster. And for me, the only real, and this is not even a silver bullet, the only real improvement that I've really ever seen that really makes a big difference is convention over configuration. The idea that um, you're going to be using, you're going to be working in someone else's opinions. And the reason for that is that when you use a convention over configuration system, it lets you solve problems you didn't even know existed. And if you have, if you can only solve the set of problems that you know exist, that means you have to learn about them. It means you have to learn about things like CSRF and XSS. And if you have to do that, then you can only learn maybe half a dozen, a dozen things. If you're really, really smart, maybe like 50 things. But there's hundreds of things that you have to know. And really the only way that you can successfully be productive in an environment where you need to know hundreds of things is to work inside of an ecosystem where people are solving a lot of the problems that you don't even know exist yet. This is also sometimes known as abstractions, and it's something that works really well in many other ecosystems. But for some reason, the JavaScript community doesn't like them very much. Um, that's okay. I think people should like abstractions more. Um, I think the cross-pollination in the JavaScript ecosystem has been great. I think uh, Backbone, Angular, React, Ember, uh, Aurelia have all really learned a lot from each other. And if you look at the past five years, if you look at you know, what a web framework looked like in 2011 when it was all abstract the web, um, or like Backbone, which was 800 lines of code, and you look at what web frameworks look, look like today, it's pretty clear that we're all learning from each other. And I think that's really awesome. Um, I'll also just reiterate, I think web technologies are, are awesome. I think there's a lot of good things that the web is good at, the web is successful at, and it's really too easy, it's too cynical, it's too, I guess, JavaScript, it's too hacker news to say, you know, the web sucks, everything about the web sucks, we should just start over. It's too easy to, to say that. It's so much better, I think, to say, we have a system that lets us be in everyone's pocket, in everyone's device. We have a system that lets us run code that nobody has to go audit or, or trust. We have a system that lets us uh, build, share URLs across any text box anywhere. Um, these things are all awesome, and I think it's way too easy to throw them away, um, and, it's, and it's something that we should be proud of. And I think if you look at the past 10 years, if you look at, like I showed you, the, the set of things that we were never going to fix in 2007, I think there's a lot of hope for a better web. And I think the, the hope for a better web is not going to come from starting over, from building everything on top of Canvas or WebGL. I think the hope for a better web is that we're going to keep evolving, we're going to keep pushing as practitioners, as standards people, as, uh, as platform vendors to make the web the, the web that we want. And so I'm really excited about that. Uh, so thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I think I probably don't have that much time for questions. Either. Yeah, so thanks a lot, Yehuda. Uh, we may take a couple of questions. Yehuda is going to be around, so you can ask your questions later as well. Plus, I'm at a, on a panel tomorrow, today, right? So you can ask questions then also. Yeah. Uh, hi, Yehuda. Uh, I'm Narendra. Uh, okay. We at Crowdfire, uh, we use Ember CLI, Ember JS, and thanks to you that we serve uh, 11 million of our users successfully. So. Uh, my question for today uh, comes with a discussion which we usually have at our office, is that uh, can we have a server-side rendering with Ember, uh, something like partial rendering uh, from the server and, or something like a hybrid app, 
So can we do that with Ember, uh, Ember JS or Ember CLI? Yeah, so the question is about uh, server-side rendering. And what's interesting about server-side rendering, uh, this is something that React figured out, but I think Ember can do really well just because of the assumptions that we make. What React sort of figured out is that when you solve the problem of re-rendering really fast, what that has to mean is that you got to use a lot of DOM that already existed before. And so um, server-side rendering is solving a similar problem, right? You have a bunch of DOM that the server gave you, and what you have to do is re-render uh, the JavaScript on top of it and only make changes that need to be made. Ideally, there are no changes that need to be made. And so uh, when we built Glimmer, the Glimmer engine, we were careful to make it compatible with this idea. Uh, we built a, a SEO version of Fastboot. So Fastboot is, is the name of the thing that does this in Ember right now. There's an add-on called Ember Fastboot that does that. Today, it, it doesn't uh, allow you to make a hybrid application, but it allows you to render some HTML that will show up you know, for Google or Bing or whatever, whoever doesn't run JavaScript. Um, and the plan over the next probably several months, uh, we actually, we have, we have active work ongoing, is to do some rehydration work. And rehydration just means make it possible to take HTML that was created using Fastboot and rehydrate it on the client side. And there, there's some sticky things there, but what's really, what ends up being good about how, how Ember works is that because we have this notion of pages already and the nesting of pages and the life cycle of pages, um, it's really easy for us to, without you having to do extra work on the, on the outer shell, it's really easy for us to say, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna just run the code on the server, we're just not gonna run did insert element, which is the, the hook that runs arbitrary DOM, and then on the client, we'll basically pick up where we left off. Um, and even add-ons, right? So add-ons sort of are living in the same life cycle. They know that there's the notion of pages and when they boot and there's initializers, right? So there, there's all this infrastructure already in place for um, application initialization, and page initialization, uh, and that really, that, that makes it possible for us to do this in a pretty seamless way. So I, I would say stay tuned. Um, probably within the next few months, we'll have a, an alpha of rehydration hybrid app. Very cool. Any more questions? At the back. Uh, hi. So uh, actually, you mentioned many times that uh, different pages of your app need to be isolated from each other, but there are also many cases where uh, the state needs to be shared between different pages. So. Uh, how do you propose we handle something like that? Like yeah, so, so the isolation is really important, but it's just a default, right? So um, I think if you were forced into total isolation and you couldn't, there were no escape valves for any kind of sharing, you may as well just use an iframe at that point. That is an iframe. Um, so Ember has, uh, there's a couple of ways that you could share. Uh, models are a common way, and models are just some data that you got from the server. Um, so an example of this would be like the current user. Right, so the current user shows up in a lot of places. In my application, it shows up in the toolbar, but it also shows up if you go into the account. Uh, the list of applications in Skylight, for example, shows up in, in the settings, but it also shows up in the dropdown, and the current application shows up in the page that you're in. So this is all shared stuff. Um, and the model system is a structured way of saying, I've downloaded some data, and now I've entered a new page. You don't just magically get access to everything. You have to ask for it again when you enter the page, but it will be smart about not downloading things that were already downloaded and things like that. Um, so that's one, one vector, and I think that, that ends up being powerful and, and useful. Um, and the other one is a thing called services, and services are more about uh, things that are evented. So for example, if you're writing a chat application, you probably don't want to model your chat application as a single model with, with like a latest message property that changes and you're observing it, that would be terrible. What you want is an event that says, uh, there's a new message, you want to show it, and that makes sense as a service. But again, you don't just get access to all the services globally, you have to ask for a service to, and you get the service when you ask for it. Um, so the idea is that you get isolation and you can, you can punch through the isolation, you can ask for some sharing, but you have to do that on purpose. And, and what that ends up meaning is that it's really easy for someone who's coming in and you know, maybe, maybe someone's making a change to a service. They can easily go and say, here are all the pages that use that service and how they, they might be affected by it. Cool, uh, we don't have much time to take further questions. Uh, so Yehuda is going to be around. Or Thank you. you can send questions to us. We will get them answered through Yehuda.